right guys instagram doesn't seem to be working so we're just going to go live on twitter and youtube i'm gonna have to look at this another time okay so welcome to be real tv we just watched the live stream with andrew and tristan tate it was the first emergency meeting with the brothers okay now i'm live on instagram am i okay so just reiterating you guys are on twitter or instagram watching me then please you need to head over to youtube.com forward slash be real tv and uh yeah if you want to pose any questions on there then you can do so so let's get into it it was i'm going to start with the end of the emergency podcast andrew seemed to get a little bit emotional i think at the end and i think it's normal right he's a human being at the end of the day and i think as men we have a certain persona that we put in front of the public image right but for me i thought that andrew got quite emotional towards the end and i don't know if that's a reason as to why he ended the emergency meeting just one second guys i need to put this on charge before the battery dies give me a sec Yeah, so here's the thing, right? I thought to myself, I watched this, and it seemed to me like Andrew got quite emotional in that in that live stream towards the end, and I believe that that was probably the main reason. Rapid Blaze, welcome to Be Real TV. Just let me know your thoughts, guys. Just comment away and let me know what your thoughts were on the live stream with Andrew and Tristan Tate. So. For me, I thought Andrew got quite emotional. I'm hearing rumours that there was a power outage and they cut the power. I think Andrew started to get a bit emotional, so potentially they could have cut the, uh, cut the broadcast because of that, but maybe it was something else, I don't know. Um, look, there was a lot of stuff that happened in this emergency meeting. In this live podcast, this live stream, I'm going to cover all the different components as to what was covered by Andrew and Tristan Tate, they mentioned some stuff about the case, which for me was some stuff that I didn't know about. And it's changed my perspective on the case quite significantly because we didn't know a lot of stuff, right? There was rumors going around, information going around, but until you hear it from the horse's mouth, it's difficult to ascertain what the real situation is. So here's what I think. First component is from, let's go from the beginning. So Andrew came in as usual, topless, and Tristan came in in his suit looking all slicked out. And um, Tristan was drinking. Andrew obviously wasn't. It seemed to me like Andrew was a bit amped up in this emergency meeting, very emotional. Tristan, not so much, right? What's interesting about the Tate brothers is this. And please just leave your comments and let me know any, any questions you've got or any comments you've got about the emergency meeting. Let me know your thoughts on the Tate brothers. But for me, what was interesting was this, is that you've got the two brothers, you've got the elder one and you've got the younger one in Andrew and Tristan. And it seems to me that Andrew takes on the vast majority of the burden of the two brothers and Tristan, you know, as was said in that, interview uh with um shout out to value tainment that tristan has a superpower of not giving a fuck and i think at the end of the emergency meeting that was very apparent andrew was extremely emotional he wears his heart on his sleeve and he was amped up shouting expressing expressing emotions after all that the brothers have been through tristan was subdued and he was relaxed and calm what was very nice was this brotherhood, right, that we've seen of the two brothers. And it'd be nice if all brothers had that, that Tristan, I wanted Tristan to step in because it seemed like Andrew was 
not losing control because he's not a person who loses control, but he did seem to go down a route. And remember, this is a live stream that they're doing after their incarceration where, you know, it was getting quite emotional. And I think Tristan stepped in at that point and said, look, if they want to put a bullet in you, I will step between you. If you were going to go to jail, I will go in jail with you. And I think that support from Tristan is what makes Andrew Andrew and has enabled them to do what they want to do. And this brings me on to a topic about masculinity and brotherhood. It is extremely important, and I've realized this, especially as I've gotten older, that you don't segregate and leave your friends, your brotherhood behind. It's very important that you prioritize your brotherhood. Because essentially, it's your brotherhood that will lead you to success. You can't do anything by yourself. When you're siloed, it's very difficult to achieve anything in life. When you have a strong team, you have multiple minds working together, you will be able to achieve far greater success. If you think back to any time in your life when you've had a, a certain situation which you've had to tackle, did you tackle that situation by yourself or did you make a phone call? Did you ask for help from people? Okay, All the successes that you've had in your life, did you was were them successes solely down to you or were they down to teamwork, down to people that you trust, down to the advice that you got from different people? Because the reality of the matter is you can't really achieve much by yourself. So let's talk about the emergency meeting between Andrew and Tristan Tate. It took place on Rumble. I think a lot of people will not have watched this because of the application. I think had it been on YouTube, it would have been it had millions and millions of views. But I know it got around about over 400,000 views we were looking at on Rumble. I watched it very closely. Uh, as I joined the application for some particular reason, we saw Channel 4 playing. I have absolutely no idea why Channel 4 was playing. Um, by the way, guys, if you all are leaving any comments, please head over to our YouTube page, youtube.com forward slash Be Real TV. <laughs> TV, uh, and just one second. Yeah, we're still live. We're still going good. So head over to youtube.com forward slash be real TV. Make sure you subscribed and please leave your comments in the comment section and let me know your thoughts. Even if you haven't caught the live stream of the brothers, the first emergency meeting between Andrew and Tristan Tate. Okay, so look, <laughs> it was funny. Okay, so this this <laughs> this live stream, right? It had emotions in it. He had Andrew pissing off his younger brother Tristan a little bit. It seemed like he did seem to ruffle his feathers and get underneath him a little bit, as is usual with the brothers. Uh, but we saw some interesting points that they made there. So let's go into a Tristan highlighted some of the more detailed information because Tristan was the one with the laptop in front of him and he seemed to give the, the details, some of the details on the case. So Decot, um, they dropped five charges on Tristan Tate and uh, Tristan was looking at six accounts of human trafficking, but that got knocked by, knocked all the way down to one. So five of the charges got dropped and he was saying that he doesn't know how they got dropped and where they disappeared to. But I'm going to tell you the point, right, which in this particular live stream, what really stood out to me was this part about uh, how it was actually the ch raised in uh, 2021. So the charges, that the, the accusation, sorry, happened in 2021. Now, by 2021, Andrew and Tristan were already quite wealthy, had a significant net worth, and there seems to be allegations put, you know, put on from the general public as well that how do these guys, how do these two brothers raise to such prominence? How did they reach to the heights that they got to? And what's interesting to me is that a lot of people were thinking that these charges were related to some of the older videos, some of the stuff they did in their previous younger life, but when you know, and they were pretty, you know, but let's be honest, they were they were bad boys, ex-kickboxers. But the thing of it is, is that just because you're a bad boy, just because you're masculine, that doesn't make you guilty of a crime. And it seems that the media are portraying them in such a light just because they were kickboxers, just because they were masculine, because they were rough, treating that like it's a crime. And Tristan actually mentioned that it was in 2021, after they had a net worth of over a hundred million dollars. That these accusations have been raised per se and uh, that they apparently created this uh, criminal gang 
and uh, were taking money from people's from women's TikTok accounts and you know carried out this human trafficking, which is completely bizarre. Why would a person? Why would two individuals who are already wealthy go on to create a criminal gang at that time? When I heard that, it was solidified for me that these charges are completely bogus that these charges are fabricated and it is a genuine attack from the matrix i know there are people who feel that this attack is genuine that there is some you know eligibility behind it that there is some truth behind these charges but think about it these two brothers are extremely wealthy they're on their way to success they're well you know back in 2021 they were rising on the internet they were getting exposure why would they put themselves in the limelight if they are making money from something that does not require exposure on them it doesn't make any sense you see where i'm coming from why would they do that so it makes no sense for me why would they do that in 2021 when they're already they've already got a significant portion of money they're rising why would andrew and tristan at that point when they're wealthy they've got good cars they're making money why would they set up a criminal gang and set up a human trafficking scheme. Why would they do that? It makes absolutely no sense to me. Okay. Now, a lot of people felt that it was related to the old webcam business that they had. Well, according to what Tristan said, that's complete bullshit because it wasn't. It's it's 2021. They made their money from the webcam business a long time ago. Now, regardless of what you feel about the ethics and the morality behind having a webcam business it isn't illegal and irrespective it's nothing to do with the case so you have to ask the question why have these charges been raised in 2021 these are significant charges human trafficking it's not some small charges it's significant and they could be looking at some serious time in prison if proven guilty and it seems as optimistic as they are i think you could sense in andrew's voice the frustration and the anticipation and the worry, the legitimate worry, that they might spend some serious time be behind bars. And I think that Andrew does feel that way, that these charges are going to go through and they are going to fuck them over, basically, part of my language. Um, but there was some humour in the in the live broadcast, right? There was some humour. Andrew Tate was talking about his yoga fire. And for those of you who aren't signed up to his emailing list, he was said there was emails going out when he was in prison. And apparently, from what I remember, he was in the laundry area and some people were trying to pick a fight with him or there was an altercation or something happened. And he said to them, do you know about Yoga Fire? Now, for those of you who don't know what Yoga Fire is, you all need to go and you all need to play Super Street Fighter on Sega Mega Drive or any of the Street Fighters. But Super Street Fighter was the one that we had on Sega Mega Drive. You can play that game and uh, play with, was it, Dalsim? So Yoga Fire, if you don't know, you need to go check it out or maybe you're just too young to know but you need to figure that out so anyway here's the thing right so they've gone on this they've gone on this tangent in the in the emergency meeting and, they've, and they're talking about the case but andrew was quite quiet when when tristan was talking about the case and i think that is because tristan seems to be a bit more calmer in them situations but i don't believe that andrew can't couldn't have done so i think that it was just tristan's job because you know in these emergency meetings we do see tristan carrying the meeting, asking the questions, giving the facts, being on the laptop and Andrew's freestyling a lot of the time. And that's the sort of tangent that they take with it. And that's the way they've structured it. Um, so yeah, man, Dalsim, Rapid Blaze, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube. Please make sure you're, you've got your notifications on and make sure you're following the channel. Okay, so uh, you need to go to the bell notification icon, Rapid Blaze, if you haven't done so already. I think you were on our previous live, right? So here's the thing. Okay, here's the thing of it. Give me a second. Okay, so here's the thing of it. They talk about mind control and the mind being free. Now, the mind is an extremely powerful tool, okay? And I want to talk about this a little bit. We're going to cover each point one by one. Andrew and Tristan raised. We're also going to talk a little bit about the interview that was that took place with Valuetainment. So, for those of you who don't know, Valuetainment has been rising exceptionally under the watchful eye of Patrick Blair David. Now, he's made his money outside of uh, the world of social media. Anyway, but Patrick Blair David has been 
like selling in the, in the world of YouTube and they've got their own website and their own platform, which is Valuetainment. And it's offering a an alternative to the mainstream to the mainstream media. Yeah. It's offering an alternative. Now we see the likes of Tucker Carlson, who shifted from Fox News over to Twitter. The fact that Andrew, after the BBC, went to Valuetainment and, and Valuetainment did a far more in-depth, overall better rounded interview with Andrew Tate speaks a lot about the BBC because the thing is this, the BBC, okay, did a terrible job and they went in with a straight hit piece and... Just bear with me. Okay, so oh, let's get back to it. So we've seen now, right, that the, the two brothers, they've given the interview with Value Tayman, and the fact that the BBC could not conduct a thorough interview says a lot about the BBC they've got so much funding so much money available and they've made fools of themselves and Valuetainment carried out an extremely in-depth interview with them where they asked them questions about his religion they asked questions uh, somewhat a few questions about the case what they could they asked him about jail life they asked uh, the Tate brothers about a variety of things which we're going to cover I've got all that down as well but firstly, we're going to go through this emergency meeting. So it's interesting that they're on Rumble and they still manage to garner hundreds of thousands of people on their live on Rumble. But it was extremely entertaining. And not a lot of people can entertain like them fucking two brothers can, let me tell you. And they are funny as fuck. But here's the thing. Um, they talk about the mind. And this is a very interesting topic as this because stoicism comes into it. See, your mind is one of the few things in life that you can control because when you can control your mind, okay, regardless of where you are, you can remain in a state of happiness regardless of what's going on around you. So just think about this for a second, yeah? If your life is in complete turmoil, okay, you've had family members die, your wife's doing your head in, kids doing your head in, your job's not going well. Everything around you is erupting, eroding, and being destroyed. Okay. Let me explain. Even though all that is going wrong, if you can control your mind, it doesn't matter what's going on in the rest of your life. Unhappiness is internal. It is what you make of it. Your mind is what determines whether you are happy, whether you are sad, or whether you are angry. It is your mind that turns that information on the outside world internally. It's what, it's what internalizes these outside issues that you face. So happiness, unhappiness, anger, all your emotions can all be controlled by your mind. And this is what Andrew and Tristan talk about is stoicism. So basically, let me tell you about the philosophy of stoicism in a nutshell. Some of the components to stoicism are reflecting. So let's say, for example, you're about to go to bed. If you're about to go to bed, before you go to bed, it is important that you reflect on your day. Think to yourself actively, how did my day go? What did I do right? What did I do wrong? And what could I do better? That is the only way that you are going to get any better in life. If you don't reflect on yourself, if you don't reflect on your day, your actions, you are not going to get any better. And this is the thing what these two brothers talk about, particularly Andrew. He says he doesn't read. I find that a bit difficult to believe because he has an in-depth understanding of philosophy. A lot of people don't read philosophy nowadays. But philosophy comes from great philosophers from old, okay? And whether it was a great leader of Rome, in Marcus Aurelius, or if it was uh, the likes of Al-Ghazali in the Islamic world, or Plato, philosophers spent their lives dedicated to philosophies in which in the way in which you live your life and it is these men 
that mastered the art of the mind, what to do with the mind, how to live your life, how to act and how to carry yourself for a life that is happy and a life with purpose, with morality and ethics as well. So, you know, people talk a lot about religion. In religion, particularly Islam, it is difficult to ascertain the correct information, and the same applies to Christianity, to ascertain the correct information from the different sources and apply that to your daily life because we are only, I'm a young man, only been on this planet 30 odd years, okay? For me to be able to ascertain information and understand everything about life from text is very difficult. Therefore, you should go to people who are well-learned, who spent their life studying and read countless books, lived life, and you take from other people. That's the smart, intelligent thing to do. That's why reading is good, because you are summarizing information from another person's eyes. When you watch YouTube videos and you watch good YouTube videos of people who have had success, you will be able to ascertain their, br their brains and their knowledge much more quicker than you would through a book. But basically, the trick here is to go and try and find great men to learn from. In today's day and age, people ask a lot of the time, why are you obsessed with Andrew and Tristan? I'll tell you why I follow these two men very closely. It's because in today's day and age, there are very few men who have been able to find success in all metrics, physical, spiritual, mental and financial you will often find most people have success in other areas of life maybe two out of them maybe three out of them but very few have been able to achieve success in all their metrics andrew tate is the type of person who you should follow the reason being is because his lessons in life will help you become the best version of yourself so they also talked in this emergency meeting about influencers now this is the thing these influencers in today's day and age, I'm not going to name them. In fact, I will. The Logan Pauls of the world, Jake Pauls, KSI. These people are genuinely clowns. They make clowns themselves and they've made a successful living, but they're genuine clowns. They put on costumes. They act like idiots. They go whichever way the wind blows them. And this was something that came up in the emergency meeting as well, was these influencers and how they are destroying the minds of young people after hearing this shit right that this shit these allegations were brought up in 2021 that solidified for me that the allegations that took place happened in 2021 that solidified for me that these allegations for me are bogus i think that i really genuinely think they are bullshit if this was back in 2017, 18, that they did something before they gained prominence, before they got rich, it would make it more believable at least. The fact that it's 2021 honestly shows to me it's bullshit. Okay. So question for you guys. Do you all feel that the Tate brothers are genuinely, genuinely guilty? Or do you have any doubt in your mind if they're guilty or innocent? Because I truly don't believe that the Tate brothers are are guilty in any perspective. I think it's complete bullshit. Um, so, look, here's the thing, right? We were talking about the mind and philosophy. So, when they were locked up in jail, it's the true test of a human being because your mind can go crazy. I've had times in my life where I've lived alone for significant periods of time. And when I was younger, I struggled the reason I struggled was because I've never lived by myself. And most of the problems that we go through today are because we can't control our minds. And when our minds are free to wander and you're not doing anything, you're not busy, you're not occupied with something, you're not around other people, your brain has, a f has free reign to go into places wherever it wants. And that is dangerous because when you allow your mind to do that, right, it's going to go into places where you don't want it to go. It will think about things you don't want to think about and it will obsess and it will go through this door, then that door, then that door until you're in an area in your brain, you're thinking about things which will drive you completely insane if you let it, okay? Tate is a fucking, uh, Tr Tristan is a fucking living legend and so is Andrew. I do believe that the Tate brothers are fighting this battle which I feel really sorry for them because I do think they are a force for good. They're giving, what is it, 25 million pounds a year to charity through the Tate pledge. Which is, which is very impressive, okay? But back to what I was saying. So these, the two brothers, they've gone to jail. And because they've got this mindset of 
stoicism they've got a mindset which is from what i can see apparently pretty much unbreakable but that's going to really be tested i think it's really going to be tested and they said this as well in the podcast that they spent years tristan said this that they spent years preparing tristan spent years preparing so what does that mean they spent years preparing well you know nowadays we live our lives in a manner where we live our lives in a way where we think everything is going to be hunky dory for the rest of our lives but what people don't understand is this your life if you think about it it doesn't go in a linear path you could go linear downwards you could go linear upwards but that's not the way life works what actually happens is this Hear me out. Listen very carefully to this. Pay attention. Your life goes through peaks and troughs. Okay, so sometimes you're up. Okay, you're with that beautiful girl. Life's going amazing. Mum and dad are alive. Everything's going fantastic. And then, bam, someone dies. Boom. Two, three months, you go on this absolute slump. And you go down in your life. Then what happens is... Shit recovers, three months go by, four months go by, life starts to pick up again, you start to get enjoyment, and bang, another problem happens. And then what happens is, these issues ripple through your life because you don't fully get over this problem. You don't get fully over this problem. And they start to mount up and mount up until something really bad happens to you. And then what happens is, the ability to be able to enjoy yourself in life becomes harder and harder. See where I'm coming from? Because the people that you love the innocence that you have from your youth starts to erode. Life becomes tougher as a man, particularly as you get older. You have moments of happiness, but you have many moments of sadness. If you don't train yourself from them difficult moments, you will not fully be able to get through them moments, first of all, and be able to excel beyond them moments later in your life. You see what I'm saying? And this is what I think Tristan is coming to, is that when they went into prison, they were combat trained. When they went into prison, they were trained in their minds. They were strong-minded. They were physically strong. They were combat trained. So when they went into prison, they were ready for it because they were preparing. Now, had they been, okay, they're big guys. And yes, they are ex-kickboxers. But if they weren't in shape in prison, I'm, I'm sure it would have been a totally different experience for them. But they're two brothers who are units. And this goes down to your life, right? This goes down to my life. Are you in shape mentally and physically and financially? Because they also talked about this. They talked about, and I'm jumping from topic to topic here, but they also talked about if you got locked up tomorrow, something happened to you tomorrow. And if you don't live a life where you're extremely top of the ocean, top of the world, bottom of the ocean, you could still have a moment in life where you crash. Because you could have a situation where you're involved in a car crash and you're physically impaired. You could have a situation where you get fired from your job. Mentally, you get eroded. Something happens in your life. Imagine this. Let me, let me put something to you. I'm sure most of you have either a mother or a father. How would you feel if your mother and father were no longer in this world? What would that do to you mentally? What would it do to you mentally? I'll tell you what it would do. It would fuck you up. It would fuck you up so badly, right, that you would never truly be repaired from it. You would never truly be repaired from a death in your family, okay? Imagine if you're married. Imagine you've got a kid. Imagine that your child died before you. Imagine that your wife left you for another man. Imagine that these traumas and problems hit you as a person. Imagine your job got taken away from you. And you were unable to provide and became bankrupt. These are all possibilities. Imagine your leg broke, right? And this is the thing. Here's the thing. They are talking about being prepared for the worst aspects of life because nobody really truly prepares for the worst aspects of life. Everybody lives life. They go through life expecting the best. You should go through life expecting the worst and hoping for the best. You heard that saying, right? And the reason is, is because you need to live a life that is happy. You shouldn't live a sad life, but you should live a tough life where you are hard on yourself and you excel to the 
epitome of what you're capable of. And a lot of people don't do that. The reason I look up to Andrew and Tristan is because they are men of caliber who have reached the epitome of what they are capable of. Are they perfect? No. Do I agree with them on everything? No. But it is their lessons which they teach, which a lot of other people teach, like Jocko Willink. Joe Rogan is an example. There are several figures in the world who have these examples where you can learn from them and incorporate it into your own life if you want to, if you want to. So that's the reason I look up to them. And this is what it means to be prepared. You should be prepared for them hard moments because there are people who are in marriages and they let themselves go. They're in a long-term relationship and they let their bodies deteriorate. And remember something, your body remembers every cell that you ever gain. So if you get up to 220 pounds and you gain fat, you could lose all that weight and go drop all the way back down to 170, 180 pounds. But your body will remember every single fat cell that it gained and your natural body will go back to that weight. So if you are out of shape right now and you've got a lot of fat on your body, remember every fat cell that you gain, even though you can burn it, your body will go back to that natural state. Okay, so if you get too comfortable in your relationship, you're too comfortable in your life, you reach a point where you've got a roof over your head, you've got a decent car, you know, maybe you don't have a Ferrari or a supercar, but maybe you've got a Mercedes parked outside, right? Maybe you've got a Porsche parked outside, maybe you've got a BMW parked outside, but you're at a level where you're happy and content and comfortable. Don't forget that in a split second, life can change for you and everything can be taken away. And we've seen this with the Tate brothers, right, where they were on top of the world and, and from being on top of the world, they have had everything stripped away from them and life's become very tough for them now. And they're handling it because they were ready for this. So it's very important that the lesson that you take away from the Tate brothers here, especially in this live stream, is be fucking prepared for the worst case scenario. So let's talk about some of the other stuff, okay? So we were, we were, we've been talking about this. So they talked about the mind, about how the mind was free in prison. They talked about how they spent years preparing for it. And... They then released the most funniest fucking video ever. So Andrew Tate's talking. He's like, okay, so we got this. I've got this fan, right? I've got this fan and uh, she was she waits for me. She's so supportive. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm thinking, who the fuck is this fan? I thought, you know, what? I've seen a few videos of a few women approaching Andrew and stuff, right? But who the fuck is this fan that he's talking about? And then, boom, a video appears of the BBC interviewer, Lucy, right? And it's got beautiful love hearts everywhere. Love hearts are appearing. They've got they've got that song on, right? Which which I can't, I can't remember who the singer is. So it's, you know she's saying why are you why are you why are you so obsessed with me? And that music's on, and the love hearts are appearing. You see Lucy stalking Andrew wherever he goes, which was the most amusing, funniest thing ever. I really didn't expect that. It was fucking hilarious. And this is the thing, right? Andrew's ability to be able to entertain you, to drive emotions out of you, is what has led him to the success that he's gotten to. And you see. I was watching the, I was watching the video uh, on Netflix of uh, not the video, sorry, the series of Arnold Schwarzenegger on Netflix, and you know, in life, when you go through life over the years, you will start to see that Andrew and Tristan will no long, longer carry the same clout that they carry now. Everybody has a peak and a trough, and they go up and they go down. If you go back a few years ago, the main men were your likes were the likes of. Sly Stallone, Arnold Schwarzenegger, these were the alpha males of that era, right? Jean-Claude Van Damme, Steven Seagal. Do you remember these guys? I have Mike Tyson was top of the world, Tupac Shakur. These people come, these social media, well, not social media, these icons, these, these cultural icons, whether they were the pinnacle in hip-hop, boxing, or any other realm. Andrew and Tristan are the men of today. They are the culture today. That will change. I promise you it will change. Somebody else will come. It's funny, right? We also we always have been drawn to these masculine figures. And I was watching the rise of Arnold Schwarzenegger, and his story is phenomenal. What he achieved, he became the governor of California. Think about that. He became the governor of about 40 million people. The UK population is what, what, 50 to 70 million? I don't know the exact number. But think about that. Arnold Schwarzenegger became the fucking governor of California. He was an ex-bodybuilder from Austria came to the United States, worked his balls off, right, and became the governor of Austria, uh, of um, of was it yeah California? Think how fucking insane that is. How hard he worked. If you don't look at his lessons, you don't read his books, you don't try to learn off Arnold Schwarzenegger. What the fuck are you doing in your life? 
it is imperative that you have role models and idols to look up to for success. Now, obviously, from a religious perspective, I do believe you should look at the prophets like Jesus and Muhammad, peace be upon him, and so on and so forth. But in today's day and age, right, instead of watching bullshit, follow these people who are successful. Follow the likes of Sly, follow the likes of Arnold, follow the likes of, of Andrew Tate, because you will quickly start to see that the things what have made these guys successful is... Is, this, is the same things, right? They will work on things. They're soft skills, which you have never spent a fucking day working on, okay? I'll be honest, I've been trying really hard. And I think when I was younger, I wasted a lot of time, which I wish I didn't. But if you right now are in your early 20s or mid 20s or even late 30s, whatever age you are at, you should try to become the best, the best version of yourself. There's always fucking time to pick up a book and read a book, right? There are some fantastic books you can read. Fantastic books. 48 Laws of Power is one of them right and this is the thing yeah jeffrey i agree with you masculinity is a rarity these days especially intellectual masculinity it's always been a rarity because there's a lot of fucking idiots out there and like i said to you the thing that is unique about andrew in today's day and age is that andrew and tristan have excelled in their words in all realms of human endeavor there are a few people in today's day and age who carry the physical prowess of them 80s superstars like Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sly Stallone, okay? Few people carry that physical authority. There are few people who carry mental astuteness like Andrew Tristan. And there are even fewer people who have the spiritual and ethical elements like Andrew and Tristan. And this is what I really like about Andrew and Tristan, which even the likes of Sly and Arnold don't have, is Arnold and Sly aligned with the Matrix when it came to their beliefs, their political affiliations, and what they did, okay? They basically sold out and did whatever they needed to do to get to the height of their success. But great people like Bruce Lee, great people like Muhammad Ali, great people like Michael Jackson, you notice that these people were anti-establishment. Michael Jackson was anti-establishment. Tupac Shakur, Z, let me touch on this. So if I get into, so we've got a comment here saying, if I get into my too masculine mode, I'll kill the next one who tries to violate. This is the issue I have. So let's talk about this issue. This issue, what you're talking about is a lack of self-control. It's extremely dangerous. If you do something because you want to do it, that is perfectly fine. But if you do something that you don't want to do, that if you were in a calm state of mind, you wouldn't do it. This is something that you need to work on because it is in moments in life of rage where men make the biggest mistakes, which changes the trajectory of their life. Five seconds in your life, five seconds in your life can change the next 50 years of your life. Let me tell you what I mean. Let's say, for example, you are with your family and someone utters a racial slur at you. And you react to that where they're here and then and you go here, you go 10 levels above them. In your rage and your anger, you fight them, you hit them, you want to show your masculinity to your missus and you get into a physical alter altercation with that motherfucker. You smash him fucking so hard, you knock the fucking nose into the back of his head. He falls onto the pavement, bangs his head and he fucking dies. And don't even fucking begin to tell me that this doesn't happen. It fucking happens on a frequent basis. If you get into a wrestling match with a motherfucker on the street, you grab him, you fucking suplex that son of a bitch, bang onto the ground, he knocks his fucking head onto the fucking pavement. What's going to happen to that guy? He could fucking die. You punch a person, you learn how to throw your fucking hands, you throw with some good authority, with the knuckle, pierce it into his chin, knock him on the ground. What could happen to that individual? That person could die. Then five seconds could change the trajectory of your fucking entire life. That is why it is imperative that you learn some philosophy in your life. Philosophy is what teaches you how to control yourself, how to live your life. This is what Andrew tries to teach. Be stoic. OK, you should not be losing your shit in your 20s. OK, when I was in my early 20s, my testosterone was probably higher than it is now. And I used to lose my fucking shit all the time. OK, I used to lose my shit all the time. 
Are there moments in my life now where I lose my shit? Yes, there are moments in, in my life now where I get extremely enraged. I lose control sometimes, but it is not as frequent and it is not as extreme as it used to be. Should you have that fire inside your belly and should you have the ability to be able to lose your shit, protect yourself, be able to remain methodical in your approach and do what needs to be done? to protect your family but should you have the balls and should you have the rage inside you yes you absolutely should because as a man it is imperative that you can protect your family and protect those around you okay now being stoic means to be able to control yourself okay if you watch the movie the godfather it is a masterpiece because the godfather teaches you lessons in that movie that you should learn about life Okay, let me repeat that. In The Godfather, you will learn lessons in that movie that are applicable to your everyday life. You learn several elements of self-control, when to speak, what to say, when to say it, how to say it. You learn these things in The Godfather. You see in The Godfather Part 1 where Sonny, the son of Don Corleone, he speaks to the Turk in anger and his father corrects him. And he says to him, never let anybody outside the family know how you're feeling again. Your brain's turning to mush. That is experience. When you are opposite somebody, you should be in full control of what comes out of your mouth. You should be able to manipulate the conversation to the area in which you want it to go. And you should never show any emotion that is genuine that you don't want to display. Do you understand that? When you lose control, bad things happen. If you can't control yourself, you will hit your wife. When you can't control yourself, you will hit your children. You will burn up everything around you. And you will never find peace or tranquility in your life. And you will make your life an insufferable hell. But you won't have love. You won't have people around you, you won't have friends, you won't have family, and more than likely, when you can't control yourself in extremities, you will end up in a fucking prison cell anywhere. Okay. So this is the thing. Andrew teaches stoicism. There are very few people teaching stoicism in the world today. Okay, it's not a popular area. He also talks about not missing a day of training. Now this is the thing. Regardless of how you feel, you need to be able to do what needs to be done. There were, like I said to you, we were talking earlier about life, how life goes through peaks and troughs, ups and downs. And you can have a moment where you are on top of the world on a beautiful fucking holiday. You could be in a moment where you are making tons of money, absolutely smashing it in life. Your mother, your father, your children, your family, everybody's around you. You are having success in every possible metric. And then all of a sudden, your job goes, one thing happens, the next thing happens, the next thing happens. And when problems come in life, they do not come by in, in singular aspects. They come in multiple ways, through different angles, in manners upon which you could never consider. Okay, You lose your job, your finances go down. As soon as your finances go down, you start to see your friends disappear, your friends disappear, you start to lose your shit. Your mind starts to lose its control that it once had. You don't have that stability. And then your missus leaves you. She leaves you. She takes the kids with her. You've got a court case in your hand. You're financially getting fucked. Problems come like a pack of wolves. They come together. Okay. In that moment and in their moments, it is important that you have the ability to be able to train regardless of how you feel. That you have the ability to be able to wake up regardless of how you feel, to get out of bed, regardless of how you feel, to work, regardless of how you feel, okay? In life, and it was actually Patrick Bet David who talks about this in Volutainment, he talked about the ability to be able to bounce back from losses. The longer it takes you to be able to bounce back from the losses in your life, the longer it's going to take you to reach success. The quicker you are able to get over the losses and the problems in your life, the faster you are going to be able to achieve success. Okay, now remember what I told you. Success is not in one area. Success is not fucking having a nice car and a nice house. Success is also your love life. What is your missus like? Okay, 
Is she loyal to you and she decent to you? Because I can tell you right now, I would pick a loyal, loving woman over one million pound in the bank. I would genuinely, because that is a rare thing to come by. Most people cannot ascertain that. Most people cannot ascertain a loyal, good, loving, beautiful woman. They can't. You can't find that shit. It's like fucking gold dust. You can't. So what I'm saying to you, you may have a person who has the loving, decent woman. They may have a lot of money. But are they in physical condition? Are they the best version of themselves physically and mentally? Are they close to God? Do they dress well? Are you the best version of yourself in every human metric? Because more than likely, the answer is fucking no. Okay, so let's go on to the next part, right? Adru talked about not missing training. Okay, he talked about not missing training and said that in prison, as hard as it was, they trained. Now, let's talk a little bit about training. I believe that when you train, you should train on a daily basis as much as possible. Take one or two days off, but continue to train again and again and again. Jeffrey Bungle says, Andrew Tate so popular because he tells the truth, pronouns to politics. To women, he has an insight into it all. I think Tate could be around for a while. Strong shorts in the 70s, 80s and 90s. I think everybody has their heyday, Jeffrey. If you haven't done so already, please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube. Uh, Jeffrey, please make sure that you click the bell notification icon and set it to all uh, so you get a ping when I post a video. Please just do that for me, Jeffrey. Let me know if you have any issues. So I do think that Andrew is popular because he tells the truth, but it is he is popular because of his success in all metrics and the shit that he says. I do believe that to be the case because what he says and how he says it, his ability to be able to articulate himself. Okay. Now, they showed a video of the England flag being taken taken down. Okay. So this is now we're going to come on to a very sensitive topic here. They show a video of the pride flag being hooked up in London. I think it's near Piccadilly Circus. Or in Leicester's. No, where is it? I forget the area. Oxford Circus, I think it is. So there's these pride flags everywhere, and there's an England flag. And what's happening is there's a working class man taking down the England flag. Another person goes up to him and he shouts at him, saying, You're taking the fucking wrong flag down, mate. And you know, and the worker says, You think I don't know that? The sad thing about that is England. Let me explain this to you. England was a great country. Britain was a great nation. Okay. And let me explain why it's very sad. Explain why it's sad. In the history of empires, the greatest empire that ever existed was the Brit British Empire. The British Empire, when it existed, ruled over the largest amount of landmass in the history of the world. The Mongols, the Persians, the Greeks, the Byzantines, the Mughal Empire, the Hindu empires, the Islamic empires. Nobody ruled as much in terms of landmass as much as the British Empire did. Nobody. And we are this small little island. And it is absolutely sad to see the British flag, which was hovered over the entire world, fall into the ground like that is absolutely fucking sad and british values are eroding and this is what's interesting people like tommy robinson britain first they don't realize how much they have in common with muslims for example they fight each other and i think it's about time as muslims that we became a little bit more patriotic for those who live in the united kingdom because Britain is our home and allows us to practice our religion freely. If you go to many other countries, whether you are a Sunni Muslim, whether you are a Shia Muslim, whether you are following Sufism, Wahhabism, whatever, there are many countries in the world you can't follow what you want to follow. The United Kingdom gives you the rights and protection to be able to follow what you want to follow. So it's up to us to speak out, to make a difference, not slate the United Kingdom, not talk bad about it, Religion comes first. However, we are fucking British first. I will not fucking move to Pakistan. Fuck that, ever. I am British. I will 
live here and I will die, die here. This is my fucking country. You need to be the same. My friends are here. My family are here. If this fucking place gets fucking bombed by China tomorrow, it is our friends and family that are going to die in this fucking country. And I see so much of this anti-UK rhetoric going around from fucking British Pakistanis, British Muslims in general. I'm not saying it's everybody, but there is a lot of it that I see and I'm just saying it like it is for real. It is fucking imperative that you stand for your country, that you love the United Kingdom. This country, if you go abroad, okay, you get kidnapped by a terrorist group somewhere, they will fucking send the UK special forces to come and rescue you, your ass. No other fucking other country is going to do that for you. No Pakistan's going to fucking come do that for you. So we need to be patriotic. And this is the thing what is absolutely sad. When I saw that British flag going down, I'm not lying to you. It upset me because I am a patriotic person. I am British. I am patriotic and I do love the United Kingdom. It has done fucking so much for me in life. But the UK has changed its fucking values so much and people don't like it. Nobody's standing up to it. Nobody's saying shit about it because we can't say shit about it. Because if you say something about it, you will be fucking penalized for it. And this is what Andrew and Tristan were talking about. They showed this video of the UK flag going down. Pride flags were there. and. It's, it's just fucking absolutely sad to see the removal of a flag like that. And you know what it is? I'm not against adults living the way they want to live. I, I don't actually, I don't have, let me firstly say this. I don't have an issue with a gay person being gay. I don't have an issue with it. It's not my problem. I believe in letting people live as they want to live. Okay. Right, Shweb Bakamal, UK shit all inflation, crime, it's corruption. Right, let's tackle this. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the UK. So this we're on the topic here. So we're gonna go through all these topics that Andrew and Tristan mentioned. So they talk about the United Kingdom. Andrew talks a lot about how the UK is a failing nation, how you need to move to how he's moved to Dubai. Let me tell you something. Yeah. The United Kingdom is a country of inclusivity. It is a country where the mayor of the United Kingdom, right, even though he's a fucking dick. Right, he is an absolute fucking prop, right? Like, I'm not exactly a tall guy, right? But the two foot midget in Sadiq Khan, I could slap him this way and slap him that way. He is an absolute fucking moron. He is a Muslim, but he supports everything openly which is against Islam. So he, regardless of whether you're Christian, Muslim, whatever, he is a fucking sellout and a fake motherfucker. I'll tell you that now. Okay, I used to, there was an, a part of me that liked Sadiq Khan. But honestly, I think after some stuff that I've seen of him, Sadiq Khan is a fucking prat. Okay, that's first of all. Having said that, Rishi Sunak, who is a fucking Indian, right? Indian heritage person, he's British, but he's Indian heritage, is the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Lord Mayor of Leeds, Iqbal something something, was Pakistani. Sadiq Khan, Pakistani. This country will allow you to rule the entire fucking country. And you're sat there complaining about the United Kingdom. Let me tell you what you should do. You should do your best to make this country the best version of itself. Just like you should be obsessed with making yourself the best version of yourself. You should do your best to improve your family, improve your surroundings, improve your friends, improve your community, improve the areas in which you live. That is where that is the way in which the UK is going to be better. Okay. Don't be a sellout running to another country. Okay. If you want to go to another country, you can absolutely do that. I'm not against that. But love the country you live in. And it is sad to see that our country in the United Kingdom is now falling. The reason it's falling is because we have agendas in the UK, agendas which are not good for our economy, they're not good for the country, they don't help us financially, they don't put us in a position of power against the other powers in the world. And they fuck our country, country up because, let me explain this, the United Kingdom is no longer on its high horse. Europe and America are failing economies and failing nations. China is fucking rising and them motherfuckers are evil son of a bitches. Let me tell you, they are fucking evil. I will go on camera and say this because I don't really intend on traveling to China anytime soon. 
if I do a math check, the fucking video down. But China, okay, are a communist society, right, where they will put on, they will put up certain laws which completely obliterate and destroy the hopes and the lives of a minority community. The Uyghur Muslims in China are getting persecuted, not to the same level, but in the same mannerism and in the same breath as what the Jews suffered under Germany. They have concentration camps, they've been re-educated, and if you go back and look at the way World War II played out, that is the way it started, Adolf Hitler and the Nazis, they called these concentration camps educational camps. There was propaganda up, put out there on videos that these concentration camps, that they are fun to go to, they re-educate people, and they will help set the Jews right. That is fucking evil. That is fucking evil. Just because somebody is a Jew or somebody is a Muslim, let me tell you something. There could be a person who is a Jewish person or a Muslim person, and that person could be the best fucking person on earth. He could be helping hundreds of people, thousands of people. He could be the most best human being on the fucking planet. And you're going to categorize that person based on his religious beliefs? Fucking disgusting. You're trying to re-educate him. Everybody has their own personal beliefs. You should respect everybody. China, what it's doing to Uyghur Muslims is atrocious. And it's something which many people don't speak about. All right. We are blessed to live in this great nation of the United Kingdom, a country which has a history across the world. Not all of it is good, but it is a fucking country of significance and it has history behind it. The English language is formulated of words which come from all different corners of the globe. Many words from the English language were taken from Chinese, Hindi, Sanskrit, African countries, and all around the world. Britain is a great fucking country, okay? Just because it's not all fucking good history, so what? Are you a good person? Have you ever done bad in your life? Well, let me tell you, do you know when you are live when you live a life of purpose? And you and Tristan talked about this in this in this emergency meeting, that when you are a man of purpose, somebody who actually goes and does some shit in your life and lives an interesting life, you have some good stories to tell and you have some fucking bad stories to tell. You will be at the top of the earth one minute and you'll be at the bottom of the ocean the next minute. And it can happen. That is a part of your motherfucking story. But at least you've got some fucking stories to tell. Let me tell you, I've got some fucking right stories to tell, right? I can't say them on YouTube, but I've got some right stories to tell. And here's the thing, okay? The United Kingdom, okay, is suffering. We are suffering because we have dickheads like that two foot, two little fucking shaved midget called Sadiq Khan sitting in power in London and the skinny little rat called Rishi Sunak, who's prime minister of the country, who wasn't even fucking elected. But anyway, I don't want to make this a political rant. But these people who sit in power are what is destroying the United Kingdom, okay? And we need proper leaders. We need people who can actually lead this fucking country to some good. Because let me tell you, there are some very clever people sitting in countries like the UAE, countries like Saudi Arabia, countries like China. These people are highly intelligent and we now are at war with these fucking countries. We are already at war with these countries. And it might not be a war in terms of our military, but we are at war with these countries economically. Now, look, I've got nothing bad against Dubai, and the UAE or Saudi Arabia and so forth. Okay. Uh, I will, I hope to visit there one day. But what I'm saying is the UK is in competition. Unless the UK fixes its ways, it will lose every single time to the UAE. It will lose to China. It will lose to Saudi Arabia. It will lose to these countries. You will see the properties that you own erode in their value because motherfuckers over from the east are buying up properties over in the UK. And the, and the crime rates are going up in the UK. We are losing our power, our jobs, everything over to the east. Let me explain that to you. Okay, so now, next topic. So that's the United Kingdom. Problems that we're facing are because of these virtual signaling, signaling motherfuckers in the UK running our fucking corporations. They're running our 
businesses, they're running our politics, our police, every fucking aspect has been fucking infiltrated. Every aspect of our country has been fucking infiltrated. And it is up to you to do your part to fix this because it is your children that are going to suffer. It is your children who are going to have to live in this shit all. So that's my patriotic side. On the other hand, you should be concerned first and foremost, first and foremost, with your own circle, with you, with your brothers, right? With your wife, with your children, with your cousins, with your friends, with your community, with your neighbors. You should be concerned about excelling yourself and those around you. See where I'm coming from? Because, like I said to you, excelling does not just mean financially. No, 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 get fucking twisted. You could excel financially, but if you marry a woman who is a fucking degenerate woman, and we don't have to explain what a degenerate woman is, if you get married to a degenerate woman, then you are a fucking degenerate yourself, and it doesn't matter if you've got £10 million in the bank, it doesn't matter if you've got a fucking Aston Martin parked outside, Porsche 911, or anything. It does not matter the amount of wealth that you hold, it doesn't matter if you're fucking physically built like a fucking tank, it does not matter. You are still a fucking loser. See my point? Success comes in all metrics of life. If you are not successful in all metrics, you have not achieved. Okay? Hold yourself accountable and look at yourself in the mirror. And this is what the message is in this video here. If you look at yourself in the mirror, be the best version of you in all aspects. Do not neglect any aspect. Even if that aspect is being nice to people. Are you a nice person? Do you help people? Do you help those around you? People who are less than you, who cannot do anything for you, do you give them support? Do you give them your time? Do you give them love? Are you a good person? Because if you're not, you're a dick. That's the reality. Do you follow the principles which have been set out for you by people like, like the greatest men on, pla on planet Earth which have ever existed, like the Prophet Muhammad or Jesus? Do you live like that? Are you nice to people? These are the metrics which measure success. It is not solely happiness because when you die, how happy you were in your life is not going to be the sole component of what will give you satisfaction. When you're on your deathbed, what is it that you want to think to yourself? You'd be thinking to yourself, first and foremost, what's going to happen to me after, after I die? Did I live my life where I, where I spent it in fear of my afterlife? Or did I live it in personal pursuit? Did I live a life of purpose where I could say I help people? Or did I live a life of bullshit watching TV? Because we are not built to watch TV. We are not built to stay under the covers. It would be very easy for me to get into my bed and stay warm. But we're not fucking built for that. We're built to be fucking workhorses. We are built to live a life of purpose. People have this mistake drilled into their fucking head. People who study economics will know that in the universities, they teach you that one of the main drivers of success, one of the main metrics which you measure success by is the happiness index. Absolute fucking bullshit. People, they measure it number one by GDP, but another alter alternative to that is the GNH, Gross, Gross National Happiness Index, GNI, I forget what it's called, right? Happiness is not the metric upon which you measure the success of your life. Your life should be tough, it should be difficult, and it should be filled with unhappiness because that is how you live a life of purpose. Your aim should be to live a life of morality and purpose so that when you are gone from this world, you can genuinely look back and say to yourself, I lived a life of purpose and you left something behind. So that's something I wanted to touch on. Okay. So we've gone through England. Let's see what other topics we've got. Okay, let's move on to Husserl's University. So they talk about Husserl's University, and there were many allegations that were put across to the likes of Andrew and Tristan that Husserl's University is a human trafficking ring and that and that they are teaching in Husserl's University how to human traffic, basically. Sorry if I got that miscued. I was um, just checking something on the stream. So just again, if you haven't done so already, please, please make sure that you subscribe to the channel. Please make sure you're following me. Uh, and uh, the most important thing is that you, sell the bell, you set the bell notification icon to all 
please make sure you do that, guys. So, look, here's the thing. Okay, here's the thing. With Hustlers University, I have actually heard of people taking Hustlers University. And I'll tell you something. If you are a young man, Hustlers University will teach you things. I heard they have a personal trainer in there. Yeah, I'll tell, I'll tell you how much it fucking costs for a personal trainer. Personal trainers today, today's day and age will charge you 30 to 50 pounds per session. They'll take you to the gym. They'll teach you how to do a few exercises. They won't teach you what the exercise is about. They won't teach you about diet. They won't teach you fuck all. And they will charge you 30 to 50 pounds. For this university to have that component in it shows to me that it's value for money just there. But when you're a young man, you're going to be wasting your time anyway, right? Why don't you pay that little bit of money, go to Hustlers University and actually spend it on something fucking useful, right? You will learn some skills. You will learn the basics of what cryptocurrency is. You will learn the basics of finance. You will learn about stocks, perhaps. You will learn about trading. You will learn things that you would not learn in the real world. You will learn things in the Hustlers University that you're not going to learn from university. Let's be honest. I think for me, for my value, is it going to make you a rich person? Perhaps, perhaps not. But is it going to teach a young person skills? And let me tell you something. I don't believe Andrew and Tristan Tate are the type of people to sell a bunch of bullshit. I don't believe that's true. I was speaking to Michael Sartain the other day. He owns a beauty pageant in the United States in Las Vegas, Nevada. Nevada. Shout out to Michael Sartain. He's a millionaire. And uh, he was previously in the army. And we were talking for a while and we'll be uploading the podcast shortly. But he was talking to me about his action for men course now let me tell you there's a lot of courses out there okay but the vast majority of these courses will teach you jack shit because the people who curate these courses have a following but what do they have a following of just because like remember i told you just because you have money does not make you successful money does not define success in a human being lots of motherfuckers have money i know a lot of guys who have money and their love lives are completely they're cuckolds, yeah? They are not successful because they are running around from... I know people, right? I know people who are multimillionaires. I don't want to name them, right? I'm not going to slay people. But I know people who are multimillionaires but have to go and find prostitutes and pay for that shit. Is that a successful person? Answer my question in the comment section. Is that a successful person if you have to pay for fucking prostitution? Is that a successful person? No matter how much money you've got, now everything you've got, if you have to pay for prostitution, are you a successful person? Please answer me that question. I would rather be fucking broke on my ass than have to do that. So, do you see where I'm coming from? Success is in different metrics. So, here's the thing. What are we talking about? Hustle University. Hustle University will teach you certain things which you are not going to learn in the real world. It's going to teach you how to be a man. If you are young, I would recommend you go do Hustlers University. I've got fucking nothing against it. I haven't taken it, but I know the likes of J uh, Justin Waller are behind it as well. It's not just Andrew and Tristan. Okay, so my friend pays £60 for brothel to fuck prostitutes. Degeneracy. Lack of control. If you cannot control your seed, you are doomed to motherfucking failure, right? Okay, so let's go on to the next topic in this fucking emergency meeting. So, talk about the Titanic. So, earlier we were talking about men's... And fuck me, I don't know how the hell these guys do these long streams. I need to get fucking a bit more... Um, I need to get a bit more fucking used to that. I need to keep a cup of tea on me. Finish all the water. But anyway, I can't get up now. Stream is going. So, here's the thing. They talk about the Titanic. Okay. They say that when the Titanic started to sink, the women and children got onto the boats, the safety boats, and the men had to go down with the Titanic. It's a very interesting concept because if you get locked up tomorrow, your main thing in your head is going to be that you want your family, you want your wife, you want your children, you want your mother, you want your father, you want your granddad, you want your family to be eating and to be successful and to be happy. There's a certain level of contentness that a man finds, in my opinion, that comes from sacrifice and working hard, okay? Working hard and being successful, in my opinion, is one of the metrics that leads to contentness. And contentness comes before happiness. Let me tell you the difference between contentness and happiness. Happiness is being in a beautiful... Bear with me, guys. 
we have a technical issue. Audio should still be going, but just bear with me. Give me a second. I will sort this issue out. Right, should be coming back on in a second. Bear with me. Right, okay, we are back. So we were saying, I actually had it plugged in, don't know why it's died, but I had a backup battery, came prepared for this one. So we were talking, right, about living a life of purpose. When you want to live a life of purpose, okay, it's very different to living a life of happiness. Happiness okay, will not give you contentness. Contentness and purpose and, and happiness are two different things. Living a life of purpose and contentness is sacrificing yourself for the greater good. Now, let me explain what this means. In life, men have always sacrificed themselves in war for a purpose. And, you know, it's interesting that a lot of people, they don't live like that. They live, you know, for the day, they're driving around in their cars, they're chilling out, doing whatever bullshit they want to do. And they're going on holidays, Ibiza, they're going to Dubai, chilling out. Okay, I'm not saying you can't do that. I do think you should be happy in life. But ultimately, in my opinion, men are happiest when they are busy in their purpose. Now, there is a book. I don't have it here. Do I have it? No, I don't have it here. But that book is called Mastery by Robert Greene. I always talk about this book. Mastery talks about See what Mastery talks about. It talks about find something in your life where you get completely lost in it. Find your goal and your purpose and find what really fucking makes you tick. Find what you, when you do it, you lose all elements of time. Okay? You lose the dynamic of where you're at, what you're doing, and you just find two hours go by, five hours go by, six hours go by, and you get obsessed with it. Because what happens in the moments is when you find something like that, you become a master at it. Let's take, for example, Michael Jackson. Now, they also mentioned in the emergency meeting, Michael Jackson, he said, right? Andrew said, what did Michael Jackson say? They don't care about us, but we're going to come on to the matrix in a second, okay? We talk about, they don't care about us, Michael Jackson, but let's look at Michael Jackson. So Michael Jackson, he started his career at the age of five years old with his father. So, Michael Jackson's dad, Joe, Joe Jackson, I believe he's passed away as well. May they all rest in peace. Started Michael Jackson off with his brothers. And he took him to Berry Gordy, a tender age of about, I think it must have been between, five, I think it was like five years old. And Michael Jackson was there singing and dancing like James Brown. He had this natural flair and talent blessed to him from the God above. And what happened there was this, is Michael Jackson, within a few years, okay, sang the songs like Ben, I Want You Back, ABC 1, 2, 3, Who's Loving You, and these mega hits, right, of the Jackson 5. But he stuck at it. And in them days, it was the 1970s, I believe, you had, still had the likes of Elvis Presley, and black people hadn't really, any anybody of colour hadn't broken through to the mainstream. And what Michael Jackson did, he revolutionised the fuck out of it. This is why they hit Michael Jackson. Because Michael Jackson focused he created the off the wall album which had the tracks like don't stop till you get enough off the wall rock with you but it was still black music do you know what i mean bouncy black music right and then what happened was he released thriller when he released thriller he went on to mtv he was the first black artist to feature on mtv when he came on mtv he smashed the fuck out of it overnight he broke all them motherfuckers' records. He broke the Beatles' records. He broke Elvis Presley's records. And by the way, don't even for a second think that I'm, sitting, that I'm seeing you in anything bad against white people. Absolutely not. My best friends are white and Caucasian. What I'm saying is Michael Jackson broke down the barriers. And he broke what the traditional norm was at the time because there was a stigma against black people. And how did he do that? Well, he was in one area, he focused in one area, and he went from here to here to here, focused, and he built a back catalogue of music. Now, if you look at Michael Jackson's music, you look at Dirty Diana, it's rock music, okay? You look at uh, Billie Jean, it's pop music. 
he has even components of reggae in his music. Want to be starting something? African chance. So what he became was a master of his craft, mastery. We see it in certain artists, Pablo Picasso and so on and so forth. They stick in that Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci, if I'm thinking about the right person, hopefully I'm not talking shit here, but Leonardo da Vinci, what he used to do is fascinated by the human face, facial structure. He started studying smiles, he studied human anatomy, and he struck in that field and eventually became an artist and he became one of the most well-known artists in the history of humankind. And this is what Mastery talks about. Find what you love, find what you get lost in, focus on it, and eventually, over years, you will become a success. You will go through this door, but then you go through that door. You'll enter the house through this door. You go into this door in the house, and before you go through, and then when you go through this door, you go through that, 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 that door. Let me tell you: as you get older, you will start to see that by focusing on a particular craft, you will find success and contentness in your life. And you need to dedicate your life to work and purpose and building something. It will give you a satisfaction like nothing can give you. Achieving goals, working hard. We see it in the likes of Tyson Fury, where Tyson Fury lost his mind because he didn't know what to do with his life. He stuck to boxing, which is his craft, and he's found his purpose. And this is why boxers go insane after boxing finishes. So, back to what we were talking about, Titanic. It is your purpose to go down with the ship whilst the women and the children go into their safety boats and they sail and live happily. And this is what's sad, but this is what Andrew and Tristan were talking about, right? They were talking about living a life of purpose and sacrifice, even if it means that they live a life in jail. So that's another area that we're talking about regarding the Titanic. We spoke, spoke about stoicism, okay? And We're going to come to the ending of, what time are we on? 10 past 12. Yeah, we're going to come on to the ending here. So, the sad part was the ending where Andrew Tate talked about what's he going to do in his life? Is he going to live his life like a pussy? Or is he going to and, and be a martyr? Or is he going to live his life like, sorry, let me repeat that. Is he going to live his life, calls himself the top G? What's the story of the top G going to be in 50 years? Is he going to live his life like a pussy, looking over his, and, 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 and just go quietly and shut the fuck up and not say anything? Or is he going to continue speaking the truth and be a martyr? What's it going to be? And he goes, and, he, and this is where he got really emotional. Is that he said that I have two choices. Either be I be a pussy and I shut the fuck up and I wear fucking stupid suits. But he can't do that. He can't do that because he is the son of a great man in his eyes. And this is what matters, right? Sometimes I think to myself as well, you know, who am I? Who are my ancestors? And I know some stories of my granddad. And it stops me from doing certain things. It makes me do certain things. When I think about what my bloodline is, who other members of my family are, I can't be a pussy and I have to be a man of purpose. And I think that Andrew, sad, right? But I think Andrew also feels this, that he has to be a man of purpose. And I think this is where he got very emotional. And it was lovely to see his brother Tristan by his side saying that I will sit with you in jail and I'll stand in front of a bullet. They'll have to shoot me first before they shoot you. And his brother was there with him. And that's the thing. His brother is there with him until the end. On that one, we're going to call an end to this live broadcast. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm sure there will be many more to come. My apologies for the slow start. I will continue to do these. And um, hopefully I'll schedule them in a bit more better next time. But this is the first proper one where we're live on all platforms. Please make sure before we clock out, if you haven't done so already, youtube.com forward slash TV. Make sure you press the bell notification icon. I want more comments from you guys in the next one. The last one that I had when I just went on live just willy-nilly was a lot of comments. But yeah, we are going to do more. Um, so I hope you enjoyed it. 
please make sure you subscribe and you're following all the platforms. Catch you all soon.